DevConf has actually been a really amazing experience for me over the last couple of days. I've been to a lot of tech conferences in my life, and I want to thank all the organizers, and specifically Jan for encouraging me to speak. I've really only spoken in public maybe once or twice. I've given this talk once uh, at Berlin JS to about maybe 15 people. So I am no stranger to the internet. The JavaScript community is not, I'm not a JavaScript coder, but I have a lot of background in the internet. So this talk is a little bit about your roots. So I think in order to know what you're doing and where you come from, um, you need to know a little bit about the history of the industry that you work in. Um, so I think technology and this, this talk is basically about history and culture. So history and culture is something that drives everything that we do on a daily basis. How you eat, how you look at the world, how you create art, how you create music. Um, and I think sometimes people forget that your industry also has a history because sometimes it's work and maybe you don't think about where it came from. Um, so this whole talk is about the roots of our industry and how we ended up becoming technologists and are able to empower people to do things. And there's a little bit of, I want to guide you through some of the history of Silicon Valley specifically um, because it's actually near and dear to me and I've lived, I've lived there for 11 years. Um, so, hi, I'm Lindsay Eink. Uh, I am currently an independent product manager and for the sake of this talk, an amateur historian. You can find me all over the internet at L. Eink. Um, I believe in German it's Eink. Um, but I have a background in interaction design, visual communications, but I also studied history. Um, and I'm pretty avidly into politics and culture as well. Less than two weeks ago, I moved to Berlin. I used JSConf as an excuse to finally move. Um, and that's not a joke. <laughs> I've been coming between Berlin and San Francisco for at least yearly since 2009. I first visited Berlin in 1998. So this city and its culture and its history is really important to me. When I studied uh, visual communications, I was also studying German history as well. Uh, this photo is actually from Teufelsberg, which is an old CIA spy station out in the west. If you've never been there, you should definitely go. Um, but I thought it was ironic that I'm up there and someone had graffitied this SF to Berlin graffiti. Um, I think the two cities actually have a lot in common, and I kind of want to go, I'll, I'll get to that at some point. Um, so, I'm not going to talk about myself for very long, but I spent most of my professional history at Apple. Um, I spent 2005 to 2011 working on the iTunes Store and App Store. I started as an individual UI engineer doing kind of front-end web development for what was not exactly the internet before <laughs> 2009. iTunes finally switched over to WebKit, um, I think in November of 2009, we kind of got up to speed with how the internet was working. Um, so I'm no stranger to internet technology and what it can do and how it affects people. Um, my team basically created all like interactive web prototypes, uh, promotions, if you see anything for iTunes London right now, which is happening. Um, we worked on all the back-end systems and the front-end systems to make, to make that technology work. Um, but I quit three years ago because I needed a break and I needed to do something different. Uh, I actually spent three months in Berlin when I left. So, I think this leads up nicely into a quote that I think we're possibly all familiar with. And stay hungry, stay foolish has been, I think, misappropriated to Steve Jobs a lot because he mentioned it in a 2005 Stanford speech. And especially after he died, people started making, you know, making the Steve's quote. And in fact, it actually came from the back of something called the Whole Earth Catalog. So I'm gonna go through a little bit of the history of it, but the 1960s hippie California counterculture really influenced how we got to personal computing and technology today. So I'm gonna introduce Stuart Brand. Stuart Brand is the brainchild of the Whole Earth Catalog. He is a Stanford-educated biologist with an interest in politics and art as well. Um, he 
also worked on the mother of all demos, which you guys might know with um, Doug Engelbart, and it was a famous presentation of a lot of revolutionary computer technologies, including hypertext, email, and the mouse. Um, when Stuart Brand was a kid, he was running around on this hippie bus uh, with a band of people called the Merry Pranksters. Uh, the Merry Pranksters were really trying to get, this is in 1964, by the way, um, the Merry Pranksters were really trying to, um, they were literally dropping LSD into middle America by driving this bus around and throwing spontaneous parties and doing drugs and getting Cold War America to basically see an alternative to a more adventurous and harmonious way to live. So the Merry Pranksters were not actually afraid of technology. There was a big sentiment of people really rejecting technology at the time because it was mostly being used for war. Um, so the Merry Prankfers, Pranksters really deployed technology to create new consciousness and a new form of social organization. I could talk for days about counterculture, but if you would like to read a little bit more about that bit of the counterculture, there's a book called The Electric Kool-Aid Acid Test. If you've read it, you know, but otherwise it's a good reference for um, where this mindset was coming from. But I also want to talk about what was going on in Silicon Valley at the time. Silicon Valley actually has a large root in military technology um, and military uh, investment, basically. So Stanford actually created a link between the Department of Defense and technology. So military satellites were being, being developed in Silicon Valley previously, back to the 1920s through the 40s and 50s. Um, they were making vacuum tubes, microwave, missiles, and satellites. At some point, Silicon Valley became known for what it is because of the microprocessor. Um, so there was this anti-technology sentiment going on at the time. This is a student protesting at Stanford about, he's got a punch card around his neck that says strike. And so there was, this, uh, there was a very large part of people who were really not into technology at the time. So the counterculture that you're probably used to seeing is more of these protesters out with signs and out in front of Berkeley and trying to change things based on standing around with signs. But there was a bit of a division between the countercultures. So there was this new left idea. And I'm, before I go through this slide, I want to actually credit um, Fred Turner, who wrote this book, From Counterculture to Cyberculture, with this, because he kind of divided these two countercultures. But the new left was really working through bu bureaucracy and hierarchy um, organization and established structures. The new co communalists, which would, you would consider Stuart Brand, and these kids dropping acid, but they were also quite smart, they were using small scale technologies, LSD, uh, lots of Buckminster Fuller ins inspiration, DIY technology, and shared mindset and community building. The difference is, is that the new left was trying to work with the established systems and these new communalists were really just like, you know what? This is fucked up. We don't want to have anything to do with you. We're going to do something totally different. Um, there's a story uh, of a protest at Berkeley where Ken Kesey is looking at these kids protesting, saying, what are you going to do? Stand there with signs and change something? And he just starts to play his harmonica. So this was kind of the mindset of the people that were going on there. Um, so, if the American state deployed massive weapons to destroy faraway people, this new idea was that we would deploy, deploy small-scale technologies to bring people together. Um, the counterculture looked a little bit like this. This is one of the first communes that existed. It's called Drop City, and it was in, Col in Colorado. Um, so, people started moving away from their homes to create this new this new city, this new idea, and this new way of living that was actually around a common humanity. Um, literally, Dome was the new home. This is, it was, it was literally like, okay, cool, like your suburban houses are square and we're gonna go live in domes. <laughs> uh, because seriously, this whole system is fucked up and we're about ready to get, you know, bombed by someone. Um, but, it, there was also this notion of uh, 
distribu like distributed working. So this slide says, if you can read it, it says workers of the world disperse, which I don't think is so uncommon to how you and I can work today because we have laptops and we can you, we can do our craft independently, so I think that there's kind of a link between this and how we can work today. Um, San Francisco basically became the heart of a new world for the United States, and so people were coming from all over the country to experience what this new world was like. And, and again, this is not so different to how I see people trying to flock to San Francisco today. Um, but it really was the heart of it, and it was a very, it was very much centered in the West Coast. Um, but to introduce the catalogs to our brand on an acid trip, sitting on a hill in San Francisco, literally was looking out at the Earth, and he saw the horizon of the Earth bending, and he wondered, why haven't we actually seen a photo of the whole Earth yet? This was in 1966. So he started a public campaign for NASA to um, publish a photo of the whole Earth because he believed that it was a powerful symbol for humanity, especially when you're basically facing nuclear war. Um, it evoked a shared sense of destiny um, and adaptive strategies for people. Um, and so the whole Earth catalog was born, and this is the front of the catalog. Um, it basically became a manual for people who were living on the land. But the difference was is that the catalog didn't sell anything. It was only a portal. So when Steve Jobs mentioned this in his Stanford speech, he was talking about how this was kind of like Google before Google existed 35 years before. Um, it didn't sell anything. But the purpose of the catalog was basically to um, empower people to do their own thing. So this says, where is God's? We might as well get used to it. Um, in response to... I actually can't read this, but um, this was the purpose of the catalog. The catalog was also user-contributed content, so people would write in uh, things that they thought were useful and would say, hey, I, I think that you should really publish this in your catalog, and it didn't matter who you were, and they would just go ahead and publish it. Um, but I'm actually going to pull up, I'm going to keep this quote up here so you can actually read it, um, because I think this is the core of the thinking at the time, and the thinking around this catalog and this movement highly influenced everyone that created personal technology today. Um, so this is the inside of the catalog. Um, like I said, readers could submit information. Um, and it also it included a lot of books, and it was a lot of books around mindset and thinking not around necessarily how to make gardens. Um, so it was, it was not only a functional tool for, um, you know, how to build your dome, but also a consciousness tool on how to really think about the world. Here's another one. I actually brought um, my copy of the Whole Earth Catalog with me to Berlin because it's one of most, my most kind of prized objects. I have it if you guys want to see it afterward. Um, I haven't actually even taken it out of its wrappings from when I flew with it because it's really fragile. The stuff was printed on really, really cheap newsprint paper. Um, and one of the things that I think is interesting is that at some point this calculator showed up and it was a $4,900 calculator that was listed in the catalog. Nothing was too, it had to be good and it had to be uncommon knowledge to be in the catalog. Um, so, the founding editor of Wired Magazine actually was an editor of the Whole Earth Catalog. And he basically said, look, Sir Brand created the blogosphere before there was even an internet. So, the idea of the Whole Earth was basically that people could rally around and get together around their common ideas, which is, again, really not so different than what we do on the internet today, on Twitter and wherever. Um, so this is a photo of Alan Kay uh, and the first GUI. And uh, Xerox Park Library actually had a lot of the books from the catalog in their library. So Alan Kay actually talks about how he was really influenced by the thinking of that, of that time. Um, and this counterculture started to actually permeate 
into university labs and um, at uh, the Stanford uh, AI Institute, there was this, <laughs> there's a story about how people um, would sit around naked in a sauna smoking pot waiting for their code to compile. <laughs> Because you had to schedule your time, and so what do you do? You smoke some weed and you compile your code at some point. So uh, there's, there's a lot of this history, and it goes on forever. It, it, it really goes on forever, and I'm, I'm fascinated by it. Um, but the whole earth wasn't just the catalog. There was this whole network of people and ideas that started to come around. So there were publications after the whole earth. Whole earth was from 1968 to 74. Um, Next slide is that there was also this thing called the well, which I'll get into um, fairly in a second. Um, there's also this global business network that brands are part of, which actually is owned by Deloitte, that enables government agencies and businesses to think about long-term thinking um, rather than really short-term thinking. Um, Wired Magazine, which I'm sure you all know, and the Long Now Foundation, which is what Stuart Brand is currently involved in in San Francisco. Um, this is a photo of the well. The well is still active on the internet today. Uh, it's the oldest continuously running online community since 1985. It was started as a BBS. Um, so it's been on the internet since 30 years. 30 years is a long time, especially in internet time. Um, it's mostly known for its internet forums. Uh, it also provided email, shell accounts, access to create web pages. Um, it became one of the original ISPs, actually, when, the, in, when commercial traffic was finally allowed on the internet. Um, and what else is interesting about this is that the founders of the Electronic Frontier Foundation actually met on the well. And so they started talking about this idea, and it was, it was kind of this whole earth turns into the internet. We continue talking about our ideas and moving forward. Um, so terms that kind of came out of these are things that you know personal computer, virtual community, electronic frontier. So these people are all connected and they're all part of, um, part of our history and part of why we can all sit in this room today because we're from, I'm from the United States, there are people from all over the world here. There's a lot, um, this is required reading, I think, if you work in technology. So From Counterculture to Cyberculture is written by Fred Turner. Uh, I've met him, he's become a friend of mine. Uh, this is an academic approach to how the counterculture really influenced Silicon Valley in California. Um, a nice story about Fred is that he actually uh, lived in Kreuzberg in the early 80s. He worked at a punk theater and was also part of the counterculture here in Berlin, which I thought was really interesting. But he's a professor at Stanford now, and this is a really great book and a great take. Uh, it's a bit, it's a longer, but if you would like a more journalistic approach. There's this other book called What the Dormouse Said um, uh, by Markov, and there are some of these anecdotes about how um, the East Coast and versus West Coast ideology was shaping how personal computing and thinking about computing actually happened. So I don't know if you guys are really clued into what's going on in San Francisco right now, but I don't know what the fuck happened. <laughs> I've lived there for 11 years, and we have a war criminal on the board of Dropbox. We have Obama's campaign advisor advising Uber on how to do public policy. So we've gone from rejecting the man to totally becoming the man. We've gone from rejecting military and all of these things to becoming a part of it. And I've been in San Francisco, this stuff, this has been in the blogs forever. And it's been coming up for years and years, but now it's, it's in the international press. It's all over the place. Um, here's another one from The Economist. So this notion of, I don't know, this notion of this idealized society has turned into a basically really hyper-capitalistic view of how everything should work. Um, and here's one from a German newspaper. And I'm not really sure what happened. Um, here are some ideas about possibly what happened. The counterculture in California was pretty homogeneous, so most of the people were our middle class, white. Um, they excluded outsiders, it was really clicky. 
And there were traditional gender roles on communes, so there are photos of women, you know, carrying loaves of bread while the men's work in fields. Um, charisma was a really huge part of how you became a leader on the commune. Um, and it was kind of, you know, cool. And you can kind of see this reflected in cultures at, say, like, Google or even Apple. And it's... It's a little bit disturbing because there's a story of, you know, somebody mentioned, it's like, oh, yeah, you, you work at Google, it's really great, but then, like, the guy behind the counter serving you free lunch is making less than minimum wage, and you're kind of in this weird bubble about how you think you're changing the world, but you're really just kind of causing this disparity to continue. Um, so we need to re-identify. I really believe in this, and what I see happening, especially within the U.S. and around the world is people want to copy Silicon Valley. And I don't think you can do it. It's, it was centered in history and culture and a place and time. And it's, you've got Silicon Valley in California. Great. Makes sense. We made some silicon chips. But you've got Silicon Ali here in Berlin. You've also got Silicon Katia, apparently, which somebody just told me about. Um, you have Silicon Roundabout in London, which I'll get to, which I think is funny. Um, there's Silicon Forest in Portland, there's Silicon Beach in LA, and you have this rubber stamp of people copying a culture that doesn't make sense. So, first of all, can we stop calling things silicon? Do you guys know anybody who makes silicon chips? Really, do you? Does anyone in the room? One. Okay, apps, JavaScript, not silicon chips. Um, so I think it's time that we re-identify and re-look. And also, this culture is really old. You know, this culture is, like, I actually feel like we're kind of at the same, we're at a same historical moment with everything that's going on in the world, with NSA, we've got wars going on all over the place. And I think it's really time that we re-look and re-identify what we're doing. Um, but is anyone from London in the room? L Silicon Roundabout? Silicon Roundabout was a joke that came up in a pub by my friend Matt Bidoff, but had been co-opted and written about, and then I think the government got involved, started like funding the, funding the roundabout, funding these things. It was a joke. It's crazy. So my point is, is that we all come from totally different like historical and cultural backgrounds, and it's really important, especially in a place like Europe, and. Berlin, like, we come from totally different mindsets, so trying to rubber stamp Silicon Valley doesn't make sense. So, you should be London, you should be Dublin, you should be Paris, you should be Amsterdam, and please fucking stay Berlin. <laughs> I mean it. I see the same kind of things going on here in the city, and I chose to move here because it reminded me of San Francisco 11 years ago. And I think this room really gives me a lot of optimism because everyone I've met over the weekend is super awesome, super interesting, really about, I don't know, being creative and using technology for creative means. And so it's, it's frustrating to watch it happen, but if I have a say while I'm still here, I will make sure that Berlin stays Berlin and you guys do what you need to do because we started out about, we needed to lower thresholds and empower individuals, and I don't, I think we need to get back to that. And as you move on, this is the back of the last Whole Earth Catalog. Stay hungry, stay foolish, and thank you for letting me talk. <laughs>